Shana Tova. This summer, Ari Shavit, writing for the Israeli daily news Haaretz, wrote that Israel's fate will not only be determined on the country's northern and southern borders, but on the quads of North American university campuses. I would amend that to not only the fate of Israel, but the fate of Judaism itself, because both lie in the hands of our children. It's always been this way. The Midrash teaches that when Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai, God asked him what would guarantee that Judaism would continue from generation to generation. First, Moses said the memory of our ancestors would guarantee that Judaism would continue. God said that wouldn't be enough. Moses then suggested the prophets of Israel, that they, the leaders of our community, would guarantee that Judaism would continue from generation to generation. And again, God said to Moses, that too would not be enough. And so a third time, Moses contemplated what could guarantee that Judaism would continue from generation to generation. And he said to God that our children would guarantee that Judaism would continue Lador Vador from generation to generation. And God said, yes. Friends, we are losing our children. They are walking away from Judaism, and in fact, some are running. And what is leading them out the door is a deep generational divide with Israel. A recent Brandeis University study found that 20% of Jews aged 18 to 29 did not feel at all connected to Israel, compared to 13% of their parents and 7% of their grandparents who didn't feel connected to Israel. These numbers show a declining connection with the state of Israel by generation. We are losing our children more and more every single year. Young North American Jews face a trying reality on their university campuses. Universities have become the focal point of the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, what we know as BDS, the global effort to delegitimize Israel. One observer refers to BDS as an amoeba-like an amoeba takeover of everything Jewish on campus. <clears throat> Being Jewish on campus used to mean Shabbat dinners and Jewish dating, and while certainly some of that still goes on, Ari Shavit is right. The university has become the battleground, a war zone, and Hillel has become the central command in the war on campus for Israel. As BDS groups lobby student governments to divest from Israeli companies, and Jewish university students are faced with a difficult choice. As American diplomat and conservative foreign policy analyst for both Reagan and Bush, Elliot Abrams, explained, a Jewish student must now choose between being pro-Israel or their liberal Jewish values. And it seems, based on those studies, that many if not most, are choosing the latter. Jewish students who still love Israel and still feel close to it are asking tough ethical questions that Israel has no answer for, and the Jewish establishment forbids them to express because we worry that to do so, well, that could aid the enemy. When Shavit made his dramatic statement this summer about the front line in the war for Israel being on university campuses, he did so after interviewing hundreds and hundreds of students across North America in the United States and Canada. And he summarized what he heard through the statement of just one student, which was emblematic of all that he talked to. The student said, we feel like we've been abandoned on the battlefield. The anti-Zionists, the BDSers, they are accusing us of collaborating with evil. But Zionism doesn't understand us. It doesn't speak to us. Instead, it's, building, it's busy building more and more settlements. What are we supposed to do? And that there is why this internal struggle is so agonizing and their pain is so deep. That's why many in their in-depth conversations end in tears and many more don't even want to talk about it. The contemptible, sophisticated, and well-oiled offensive by the BDS movement is a strategic threat to Israel. 
If it isn't halted, it could position the Jewish democratic state as the apartheid era South Africa of 2020. But the real existential threat facing the Jewish people is the increasing tension between the liberal identity of, our most, of most of our young North American Jews and the distorted image of Israel as an unjust oppressor and occupier. And as a result of this tension, some come out against Israel, some are confused, and many are simply indifferent. Rabbi Bregman says that the biggest challenge that he and the staff at Hillel had during the BDS fight at UBC was not the pro-BDS camps. It was the apathy amongst many Jewish students and some Jewish faculty who didn't show up. It may be more than not caring. It may, in fact, be that they feel abandoned by Israel. This alienation is not the outgrowth of any singular particular event, such as the latest Gaza war or the proclamation du jour of an Israeli politician, left or right. There is something more profound going on today in the lives of the next generation of Jewish adults, and it may be going on for you as well, their parents. There were two fundamental events that defined world Jewry in the 20th century. The Holocaust, the Shoah, and the creation of the State of Israel. These two events are at the core of your Jewish identity, and they are in many reasons why you are here this morning. But in a different but related way, how we view these events is also why your children are largely, largely not here in shul this morning or in shul anywhere else. Three quarters of Jews, 65 and older, cite that the Holocaust is the core aspect of their Jewish identity. And more than half of that same group of older Jews say that caring about and supporting Israel is central to their Jewish life. But amongst younger Jews, particularly Jewish university students, the Holocaust is 30% less important to them than their grandparents. And Israel is 50% less important to them than their parents and grandparents. That the Holocaust is losing its prominence as an important part of North American Jewish identity may be surprising to older generations, but it's not shocking. As we move further away from World War II, <clears throat> and survivors are no longer alive to personally relate the stories of the Shoah, the Holocaust, the Holocaust itself becomes more of a historical event. But why Israel? Why are our young people separating Israel from their Jewish identity? It's not that they don't think about Israel or that they don't travel to Israel. More from this generation of young people have visited Israel through birthright and other programs than any other generation in the history of the state of Israel. And yet, 20% say that they don't feel connected to Israel at all. And when asked to name the top three elements of their Jewish identity, 63% don't include Israel on the list. There is a profound crisis of Jewish, Jewish alienation amongst Jewish young adults. And unless we recognize it, we might defeat BDS, but we will lose a generation of Jews in the process. My teacher, Rabbi Daniel Hartman, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of Jerusalem, observes that since its inception, the Zionist movement has been divided between two different ideas and impulses. The first he calls survival Zionism, which was championed by Theodore Herzl. Herzl's Zionist dream was predicated on the idea that if Jews are to live, literally just to live, it will only be possible in the context of a sovereign state, which serves as the homeland of the Jewish people. This was certainly true at the time of the founding of the state as it rose from the ashes of the Shoah of the Holocaust, but our lived experience as Jews here in Canada has shown that survival Zionism is past tense. 
Judaism is thriving in the North American diaspora. Look at this room this morning. We are filled. The second camp of Zionist ideas is cultural Zionism. Now, cultural Zionism was espoused by Achad Ha'am, a contemporary of Theodore Herzl. And Achad Ha'am argued that Israel is necessary because only in Israel can a renaissance of Jewish ideas, religion, values, language, and culture be attained. This, too, is no longer the case, if it ever was. To most of us here, Israel is not the center or source of our Jewish culture or identity. The synagogue, the North American Jewish community, what we are doing right now and where we are, this is the center of your Jewish cultural and religious identity. Those two Zionist lenses, they are out of date and they are incoherent for most of our young, and maybe for some of you. While Israel faces an existential threat from Iran and others that wish to destroy it, the Jewish people do not. Our greatest threat is internal. Our greatest threat is apathy, particularly amongst our young. There's a story, a story that about an hour or so before the opening of the session of the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, on August 29, 1897, Theodore Herzl asked his aide, David Wolfson, to create a banner for the hall's entrance. A stranger to Basel, Wolfson had no idea where to go to find such a thing. He ran through the streets and the boulevards of the city, scouring the shops to try to find a suitable emblem for this incredible event. But nothing could be found, nothing appropriate. Exhausted and frustrated, he happened into a small shul. He sat down in the pews. And there, looking around that sanctuary, he found it. He saw his emblem. He took a large blue and white talit, and he trimmed off the seat seat, the fringes. And then from his pocket, he took a fountain pen, and he scribed in the center of that talit between the two blue bars a Mogen David, a six-pointed star the Jewish star. And thus was the Israeli flag born, a country whose flag is a talus, whose anthem is a prayer of hope, hatikva, is worthy of our best hopes and our highest expectations. It is worthy of our children's love. We taught our children those values. We weaned them on tikkun olam and social justice and the idea that the word mitzvah, though inaccurate, means good deed. We taught them to see the suffering of others and to act with compassion. Because those people, they were our people just generations ago, if then. We taught them that their Judaism demanded that they fight for justice, fight for equality, and a more peaceful and equitable world. We taught them that their Judaism is inseparable from their Zionism. It is literally woven into the very fabric that symbolizes the country. We taught them to care. And we taught them, if you will it, it is no dream. We weren't wrong to teach them these values because they are our values, they are Jewish values. But they are struggling, our children are struggling to see those Jewish values in the Israel that they hear about on campus today. They read about on Facebook, and they are racked with questions. Keneged Arba Banim Dibra Torah. The Passover Haggadah speaks of four questioning children, the wise, the wicked, the simple, and the one who doesn't even know how to ask a question. We celebrate all of those children because we know that to ask, to be at the Seder, to ask questions is to be engaged. We celebrate the question, the struggle in Judaism. How we answer questions, that is a big responsibility, as any parent will tell you. Answering openly and honestly, such as is offered to the wise child, encourages more questions and more searching. Defensiveness and belligerence, such as is offered to the wicked child, well, that encourages only more belligerence. And ultimately, they stop showing up at the Seder. They'll just tune out and walk away. 
Here's what our children want to know. What exactly should Israel be doing now? They want to know why the campus is erupting with BDS and Israel Apartheid Weeks. They want to know about Arab refugees and why Israel opposes a right of return. And what about settlements? If Israel is committed to two states, as it says that it is, why the unending declarations from Israel's government about more and more settlement construction? And if they accept that Palestinian rejection of Israel is at the heart of the problem, what, they ask, does Israel propose to do about it? And beyond the Palestinian question, they come back from birthright, and they want to know why women, Jewish women, are being arrested at the Kotel at the Western Wall for reading Torah, when they read Torah at their bat mitzvah in this very sanctuary to cheers and celebrations. They want to know about African asylum seekers in Israel and how the Israeli government's refusal to accept these asylum seekers, these immigrant refugees, meshes with what they say at the Passover Seder, what we say, that we must never forget that we too were once strangers in a land. As they fight BDS and as they fight the anti-Semitism of student council meetings and Israel Apartheid Week, they are also struggling with themselves and these internal conflicts and questions. And you, their parents and grandparents, you're struggling too. If not with the questions yourselves, then you're struggling with how to answer your children when they ask them. We love Israel. We support Israel. There is no question for us that Israel's survival is essential. Its role in the community of nations is valid and legitimate, and at the same time, neither survival Zionism nor cultural Zionism validate our Jewish identity. And we too, like our next generation, feel at times alienated from Israel, an Israel that we love, an Israel that we would fight with our last breath to defend. And therein lies the problem for our children and for us. When confronting an outside foe when fighting BDS on campus or anti-Semitism in the streets of Europe or at student council meetings or even when confronted with the existential threats of Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, the battle lines are clear. But when the challenge is this gradual, vague drift into apathy, into alienation from Israel by the very brightest of our next generation, there is no simple or short-term solution or fix. But there is something that we can do. In fact, there is something that we must do, and we must do it now, before it's too late, before they go off to university and confront the whirlwind on university quads and campuses surrounding Israel. No fewer than two recent studies show a significant rise in an ongoing commitment to Jewish life and a strong relationship with Israel for those who have been meaningfully engaged as teens prior to university. Demographer Stephen Cohen reports, the greater the exposure of Jewish teens to a positive Jewish experience before they go to university, the more likely they are to have a strong attachment to Israel and to engage in Jewish activities and in Jewish communal life in their university years and beyond. Those findings implore us to intervene now, to intervene early, before they arrive on campus and are confronted with Israel Apartheid Week, before they walk to campus, turn around, and just walk away because of the conflation of things that are happening around Israel on their quad. We can fix this. We can rekindle a Zionism that sees that flag and that star as both the symbol of the Jewish state and also the symbol of our Jewish values, woven together, inseparable in word and in deed. A Zionism that does not fear the hard moral questions. A Zionism that is not survivalist or cultural, but rather hopeful. Hatikva, the hope of 2,000 years. We need to grapple with these hard questions, but most particularly our teens need to have a chance to ask and have them answered 
before they go to university. We cannot wait. We are losing them. This year, and actually beginning last year, we revamped our high school program here at Temple Shalom, and we have extended it all the way through grade 12. And it is now focused on helping our students engage with Israel and their Jewish values. We've built a course of study around answering those difficult questions that I just shared with you. And then, because it takes more than a glossy brochure and course titles to get our teens engaged on Israel, we did something bold. We said that we would invest in their Jewish future because they are our Jewish future. Last year, we piloted a program where every post-Bar and Bat Mitzvah student that completes a certain number of hours of Jewish learning and community service would have an opportunity to go on a fully subsidized trip to Poland and Israel called the March of the Living. We sent two grade 11 students on that transformative two-week trip to fight this apathy towards Israel, to make the modern witnesses to past horrors against the Jewish people, and then on to Israel to see in it its inherent value in all of its messiness and complexity and inconsistency, to find their answers to questions that we raise and discuss here. Listen to what one of our students wrote after her experience. The horrors I witnessed in Poland are to be contrasted with what I experienced in Israel. While in Israel, I had the opportunity, the privilege, the unique privilege, to witness both Yom Hazikaron, Israel's Remembrance Day for its soldiers, and Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's birthday. On Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the entire country is in celebration. The euphoria is palpable. Despite the sadness one is left after being witness, I was left with a contagious optimism and hope. Hope for a future without enemies. Hope for the Jewish people and the Jewish nation surviving despite all opposition. The hope inside of me, she wrote, is carried by every other practicing Zionistic teenage Jew today. And then she continued, the entire experience created for me a new sense of being connected to Judaism and Israel in a way that I never thought possible, in a way that my excellent Jewish education through Talmud Torah and King David has not. The trip symbolized for me all adversity and intolerance and persecution faced by the Jewish people, yet at the same time creating a sense of survival and the possibility of a better future, not just for the Jewish people, but for all humanity. Those are the words of a 16-year-old girl. That is a Zionism of hope, not alienation. The trip costs $6,000 per student, but as you just heard, its impact is priceless, and we are the only synagogue in all of British Columbia to send a delegation on the March of the Living. We need to send more. We need to send every student that commits to our course of study and to hours of community service. The Jewish Federation has vowed to pay one-third of the cost, but I need your help to raise the rest of the funds. We had 25 students have a bar mitzvah on this bimah this past year. Will you invest a tuni? Will you invest $2 for each of them to ensure that they, by the time they reach grade 11 or 12, that we can provide up to 100% subsidy for them to have this life-changing and Jewish identity-affirming experience? If you will, if every family will make a bar bat mitzvah gift of $2 for each student, that completes their bar bat mitzvah here at Temple Shalom. The Dason Foundation has pledged a significant amount to match what we raise for the next three years. Like Birthright, the March of the Living, coupled with our five-year high school course in Jewish identity, is the gateway to a connection to Israel and to Judaism. But unlike Birthright, the March of the Living, coupled with our high school program, prepares them for a Jewish life on campus before they get there. The crisis is real. We are losing our children. They are estranged from Judaism. They are feeling alienated from Israel. The Talit and the Star 
They are unraveling before our eyes. You want to do something. Help me stitch them back together. The Midrash teaches that when Moses received Torah at Mount Sinai, God asked him, who will guarantee that Judaism will continue Lador Vador from generation to generation? You and our children are the guarantors. Here is something that you can do, we can all do, to make sure that the answer remains the same. Invest $2 for each student that has a bar or bat mitzvah at our synagogue. Let's create a fund that says to them, if you continue with your Jewish education, if you don't walk away, we will not abandon you. We will engage with you. We will answer your questions as hard as they are. We will give you an experience and an education that will change your life. And through you, guarantee the Jewish future from one generation, from our generation, to the next. Can you do that? Can you do that? Will you do that? Because I guarantee you, we cannot wait. Can you hear that song? May it be God's will. Amen.